Hello fellow sim racers, and welcome to part 11 of this sim racing setup guide. This video starts to bring together everything I've covered in the preceding parts by discussing how to diagnose handling issues and then build a setup that cures them. If you've not seen any of the earlier parts of the series, then a link to a playlist containing all of my setup videos should be in the top right hand corner of your screen. This video was initially going to be in two parts, but after seeing the finished result, I decided it would make more sense as one video. You'll see why later. So since I can't go back and edit the first video now, I've basically made myself a liar. Oh well. Understanding how all of the adjustable parts on a race car work and interact is pretty tough, but it's only really half of the story when it comes to setup work. And being able to feel how a car's behaving with great precision throughout every part of the lap is a serious skill in and of itself. In the real world, there's a division of labour between the driver and their engineers, but as sim racers we don't have that luxury. So when we're creating setups, we need to develop an in-depth understanding of both what the car is doing and how best to improve it. In my opinion, there are two core aspects to setup work. Improving the way a car handles and finding speed, though there's usually a huge overlap between the two. This video is geared more towards understanding how a car is behaving and then developing a setup to improve that. Now, feeling what's going on in a car isn't something you can really teach, and it's one of those annoying things that only comes with experience. But we can cover the types of issue that might crop up with a car and some of the ways in which they can be cured with some setup work. So on the face of it, there's not a lot to it. You just need to work out what the car's doing at every part of the circuit, decide if that's good or bad, and decipher if your driving has had any impact on it. Let's start to break that down. Most corners have a braking, turn-in, mid-corner and exit phase, and by mentally separating the corners into those individual areas, we can start to form some cohesive ideas about how the car's behaving. For example, saying a car has a lot of oversteer tells you very little of use. Is the oversteer on turn-in, mid-corner or when you're back on the power? What about when you lift off the throttle? Does it happen in low or high speed turns? And that just covers the corners, what about how the car behaves over bumps? Can you attack the curbs as much as you like, or as much as other drivers can? So there's quite a lot to watch out for, but once you start actively paying attention to this stuff in detail, it becomes second nature quite quickly. Something else to consider is whether a handling trait is really a problem with the car or the person driving it. For example, rear axle locking could just as easily be caused by downshifting too early rather than a setup issue. Or how about that turn in understeer you think should be cured with some anti-roll bar tweaks, but is really a product of over-enthusiastic wheel technique? I'm not advocating that you should try and drive around problems with a car's handling, quite the opposite in fact, but it's important to consider whether a given handling problem lies in the car or in the person driving it. A commonly uttered piece of advice is to learn a racing circuit one corner at a time, starting with the hardest or the most important corner, depending on where you read the advice. And I think it can be applied to setup work as well. Rather than starting out trying to make a setup that works for 17 corners, I like to pick a slow speed corner and a fast corner to concentrate on. And if the circuit is particularly varied or I'm in a car with lots of aero, I may add a mid speed corner to the list as well. By documenting how the car behaves in these two or three corners and making appropriate changes, there's a good chance it'll behave well for most if not all of the rest of the lap. Or to put it another way, it's best not to run before you can walk. I've gone back and forth for weeks now about how to present this next section. There's a lot of information to convey and after some soul searching I've come to the conclusion that a video just isn't the right format for it. So I've made a setup crib sheet that addresses as many of the common handling problems as I could think of and the setup changes I would consider to remedy them. There's a link in the video description to download a printable PDF and if I end up making any changes in future I'll update the link accordingly. Finally, there's a great blog and associated video by Driver61 that covers this topic. Alongside plenty of sound advice, there's also some fantastic onboard footage he's captured of thrashing a radical SR1 around Snetterton. As you'd expect, the link is in the video description. So that almost brings us to the end of this guide. In the final video, I'm going to discuss in detail a setup that I built for the Audi R8 LMS in Assetto Corsa. The idea is that this will form a sort of case study that should help cement some of the concepts that I've been talking about for the last 11 parts of this guide. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, then it would be great if you could hit the like button and subscribe to my channel. And if you think the video will be helpful for others, then please consider sharing it. 
As always, thank you for donating your precious free time by watching. It is very much appreciated. So all that's left to say is goodbye, thank you for watching, and enjoy the rest of your day.